A young man walks into a hospital in San Francisco, circa 1918. He's just got back from the trenches in Europe, and he's excited to see his family again. His mother has sent him to the hospital because of his constant fever and fatigue. She kisses him on the cheek as he leaves, but little does she know that in just a matter of a few hours, his skin will turn blue. He will bleed from his eyes and ears, and in the dark hours of the morning, as he remembers his friends suffocating on chlorine gas in Belgium, his lungs will fill with fluid, and he'll drown, cold and alone on the floor of a San Francisco hospital. Today's topic will cover a specific viral outbreak. What measures did we take to slow its advance? What did we fail to implement? The best thing we can do in any outbreak is to limit our contact with others and practice good hygiene. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. The Spanish influenza, or Spanish flu, according to many historians, was the worst pandemic in world history, comparable even to the Black Plague in total deaths. The Spanish flu came across the land in three waves. The first, in the spring of 1918, was considered pretty mild and was limited in scale. The second wave began in August of the same year, mutating into a more deadly strain and spreading to a global level. We saw the third wave in the beginning of 1919, but it was contained in a handful of regions. Now, many attribute anywhere from 50 million to 100 million deaths to the Spanish flu. 100 million is an enormous amount of people. Consider that the total casualties from the Great War sits around 40 million, and that was a catastrophic number of people. Then, is the Spanish flu still the worst pandemic in history? The plague killed around 50% of the Eurasian population in a four-year period, with total death estimates sitting around 75 to 200 million. The equivalent today of the entire population of the UK, Germany, and France combined. Suffice it to say, a mythical amount of people died from Black Plague. Death count isn't everything, though. The Spanish influenza pandemic is more relevant to us today than the Black Death. Germ theory was developed in the late 19th century, and our method of treatment for the sick were a little bit more advanced in 1918 as they were in 1347. We no longer believe illness is spread by evil spirits, or bad smells, or, you know, too much blood in our bodies. It seems obvious in retrospect that the influenza pandemic is nothing to scoff at. But with all global crises, the question is, did we respond quick enough, strong enough? Will future humans look back at us with disdain, or will they applaud us for our quick action? Author and historian John Barry wrote that, The U.S. government used the same strategy for communicating about the disease that it had developed to disseminate war news. That is, an executive order to control all government communication strategy during the war that was premised on keeping up morale. Well, according to Barry, keeping up morale meant that the U.S. government primarily lied, covered up the truth, and misinformed people. The stance of the American government can be seen through the words of Chicago's director of public health, worry kills more than the disease. Now, that might be true in some cases, but the U.S. military was very keen on keeping people at work. It's hard to fight when factory workers at home aren't manufacturing weaponry because they're all dying of disease. So containment was limited to information, not the illness. This disinformation campaign resulted in almost the complete opposite of what they had intended. Barry writes that, absenteeism reached extraordinary levels. It crippled the railroad system, shut down telephone exchanges, grocers refused to open, coal cellars closed, to the point that the Red Cross reported that people were starving to death, not for lack of food, but because the well were too panic-stricken to bring food to the sick. Journalist Skip Desjardins writes that, The most critical lesson from the Spanish flu era is that the government and society can never be sufficiently prepared for a pandemic without the information ordinary people needed to keep themselves safe. Trust between citizens broke down, and even when the corrected information was provided, citizens couldn't trust what they were being told, which made it even harder to implement important public health measures. Desjardins tells of a Dr. Milton Rosenau, who took all the precautions so familiar today, testing, quarantine, medication, and identification of anyone who'd had contact with those infected. But math overwhelmed science, and cases multiplied faster than doctors could stop them. Soon, every Massachusetts hospital was closed by overcrowding, public gatherings were canceled, and undertakers ran out of caskets. The sad truth of the matter is that sometimes governments won't prioritize the right things. 
The reason that this illness was even called the Spanish Influenza is that Spain was a neutral party during the Great War and did not have the same censorship laws that the other participating countries had. Despite the fact that there was no consensus on where the illness originated, Spain was blamed for the flu at the time, simply because it was the only country willing and able to report on it. Even today, historians debate where the Spanish flu could have come from. Some point to a training camp in Etaples, France, some to a military base in Kansas, and others blame Chinese migrant workers en route to Canada. Knowing where a disease comes from is important because it helps us contain it and measure its efficacy. But determining how deadly a pathogen can be is difficult because we often don't know the real statistics until much, much later. So we need to be very careful about when and where we get our information. The CFR, or case fatality rate, is important to know, but it doesn't actually tell us that much about how dangerous a pathogen is. What made the 1918 pandemic uniquely dangerous was that it affected people in their late 20s significantly more than any other age group. Alain Gagnon, a professor with the Université de Québec à Montréal, found that the yearly ages at death during the fall wave of the 1918 pandemic in various locations in Canada and the USA report a peak at the exact age of 28. He argues that individuals exposed at least once to the 1889-90 Russian influenza pandemic strain had abnormal fatal immune responses to the 1918 outbreak. Exposure to a different influenza strain in infancy created a crack in the defense of many young people who, when exposed to a secondary deadly influenza strain almost 30 years later, could not generate the right immune response, <coughs> suffered from a secondary infection, and died. Now, the CFR of the Spanish flu was around 2.5%. So how does the 1918 flu pandemic measure up against other epidemics? The 1957 flu pandemic the 2009 H1N1 outbreak, and the seasonal flu strains all have CFRs lower than 1%. SARS had a CFR of 10%, MERS was 30%, Ebola has, currently, a CFR of 50%. By and by, the flu of 1918 was the worst flu pandemic in history, but it is by far not the most deadly pathogen out there. Of course, I'd be missing an opportunity if I didn't bring up the world's current situation. COVID-19 has a CFR of approximately 5.1% as of the beginning of April. It appears as though it is twice as deadly as the 1918 Spanish influenza. But COVID-19's global fatality rate is still in flux. Many factors can cause a CFR to vary from one country to another. Things like healthcare funding, population density, infrastructure, media coverage, and government action all change from nation to nation. So a global fatality rate doesn't tell us as much as we want it to. For example, Canada sits at a low 1.17%, the United States at 2.16%, China at 4.06%, the UK at 7.98%, and Italy with the highest at 11.75%. Those numbers sound scary, huh? But try not to get too alarmed by them. The problem with calculating a CFR in the early stages of an epidemic is that it's difficult to record the number of total cases accurately. Not every case of COVID-19 has been accounted for. We don't have consistent access to testing, and we cannot test everyone. Many cases are flying under the radar. These are figures that would categorically shift the CFR significantly, possibly making it much lower than currently estimated. So these numbers really don't account for everything. By contrasting the Spanish flu pandemic to COVID-19, you're comparing century-old data with incomplete data. And that sounds a little silly, doesn't it? We are currently in the grip of a new pandemic. And the good news is that measures that many countries let slip to the wayside in 1918 have already been implemented today. We also have a much more robust healthcare system and a better understanding of the human body, diseases, and science in general. There is something to be said of our global community, though. We may not have hundreds of thousands of soldiers returning home from disease-ridden trenches, but we do have a global tourism industry. We are learning more and more how connected we are to the rest of the world, not only through politics and trade, but through our health as well. We are all one community, and shifting blame does nothing to protect ourselves or the people we love. We just have to do our part.